Hello, my name is Zach Gibbs and I'm a content developer within education services inside Juniper Networks. And today we will be going through the Layer 3 VPN VRF internet access with a public IP learning byte. All right, so here is our topology. We have a few devices in our topology. We have two PE devices, PE1 and PE2. And then we have some provider routers, P1 and P2. And then we also have this gateway router that has connection to the internet. So that's our internet aware router. And then we have two CE, CE1, CE2, and they are part of the red VPN. Now in that red VPN, we have two different sites and we are using 10.1.2.0/24 prefix and site this site over here with CE1. And then CE2, we're using the 10.1.3.0/24 prefix. And then we have some hosts in there. Host one is 10.1.2.1, host two is 10.1.3.3. And then finally, we have this internet host that is 203.113.100 on the internet. And so what are we doing here? Well, what we want to do is with host one, we want to provide access to the internet over the VRF interface. And the CE1 device is using a public IP address that you see here, the 203.0.113.1 on its interface. And so we'll have to look at how that works because we're going to be doing some NAT here on CE1. And this learning byte won't be focused on NAT or the configuration, but I'll show you how it's working. I'll give you some sort of an idea. Okay, so with that being said, uh, what we want to do is host one needs to be able to communicate with host two over the layer three VPN. And that's already set up and working. What we need to do now is we need to make sure that host one can communicate with hosts on the internet, which we're going to use this internet host as a test host. And so we'll have to set that up and there'll be some configuration with rib groups and whatnot. Uh, to get this work. And so what we'll do now is we'll go ahead and jump to the CLI of PE1 and get this going. All right, so here are the devices. And I said we jumped to PE1 and I actually meant CE1. I wanted to look at CE1 first. Recall CE1 connects to host one and then it also connects to PE1. And so here we show the security NAT configuration. This is an SREX device. I wanted to show how the NAT rules are working. And not that this learning byte is focused on that, but it's still good to know. So what we have coming from an interface going to an interface. And so this Gigi002 interface is what's pointed towards PE1. This LT interface is what's pointed towards host one. And then we have the first rule, which is VRF, rule VRF. And we're saying anything from the site one prefix and going towards the site two prefix. So host one and then host two those two prefixes will go through, or that those source and destination prefixes will not have NAT applied. We're turn, turning NAT off for that. And then anything else that is from this source prefix, so host one prefix, going to everything else, so basically the internet, then we're going to do source NAT with the interface. So that changes that source address as it passes the CE1 device to the 203.0.113.1 IP address, since that is what is on the actual interface for Geeky002. And I could show that real quick. I could type. And you can see that we're using that 203.0.113.1 IP address there. And so that'll get nadded to that and then get routed out to the internet. And so let's go ahead and jump to PE1, jump into configure mode, and then let's go ahead and start configuring the rib group. And that's going to be under routing options and rib groups and we're going to call this uh let's see inet zero underscore red for the red vpn then we need to configure an import rib and we'll say from inet.0 to red dot inet.0 and so what we're basically doing here is we're taking copying any routes from inet.0 to red dot inet.0 so that is the vrf for the red vpn and That'll copy all the routes in the inet.0 table and, and basically wherever we apply it. So like all the interface routes, all the BGP routes and things like that. You might not want to do that. You might get extra routes that could have some unintended consequences for other traffic. So the best thing to do there would be to set an import policy for the rib group. And we'll call this rib routes. And we still need to create this policy. And so let's go ahead and jump to the policy options. Actually, before we do that, no, let's go ahead and do that. That's fine. We'll, we'll have to jump back and apply it to the interface routes for the rib group. But let's, let's go ahead and jump to the policy 
and uh, we call that rib routes. And we'll set term uh, term one. And from now, I didn't say what interface this was, and we'll be able to see this later. But the interface from PE one to P one is Giggy zero zero two. I mean zero. And so we want to say from interface Giggy zero zero zero. We want that interface route. And then we say accept. Then accept. Accept that interface route. So the second term going to be for the default route we need. And we need a default route because we need to have a default route from coming from that will be coming from GW1 to P1 or P1 to PE1. We need to have a a default route. And we do have a default route in the INAT.0 table, but we need that default route so we can then put it into the red VRF. So then host one will have a route to get to the internet and say from route filter zero slash zero exact. And then we'll say set term, term to then, to then accept. Ooh, where's my brain today? All right, so set term three, then we want to reject all other routes. We don't want anything else. So basically the first term, accepts an interface route from Giggy 000. That is the interface that points from PE1 to P1. And that's important because without that interface, we won't be able to resolve the next hop of the default route that term two is accepting and then we're rejecting all of the routes. And then after that, we need to go back to the rib group configuration and we need to set the interface routes. And we'll say rib group and we're calling this rib group or it's gonna be in the INET family and then it's going to be inet0 underscore red and that is our root group right just double checking inet0 underscore red because uh, you can't auto complete that for some reason and so that what this does here is it's since we have that policy enabled it'll take the the I'll show it, interface 0 so 0 terse it'll take the interface there that route there and put it in the the VRF table because if you look at the default route that we currently have, it uses that interface as the next hop. So we have to have that interface route in the VRF or we can't resolve the next hop of the default route in that VRF. And so we're good there. We've got that configured there. And there's one other thing we actually do need to configure while we're here, because we, we do need to configure some rib groups for PGP, but while we're here, we actually need to configure a static route. So static route, and what do we need to configure? Well, it's that 203. Dot 0 0.113.1, it's just a slash 32, so we need to specify the prefix. And we say next table is going to be red.inet.0. Now, why do we need to do this? Why is this important? Well, when we send traffic to the internet, it's basically going to go from host1 to CE1. It's going to be nadded to that public IP address, and then it'll go to PE1, and the PE1 will have in the VRF table the default route that's got a resolvable next hop, and it'll send it basically to towards uh, GW1, which is advertising that default route. Well, that return traffic, so then it hits the internet host and the internet host needs to talk back to uh, host one. So then it hits GW1 and GW1 doesn't know what to do with it. So it doesn't have a static, or it doesn't have a route for it because we haven't created a static route. And we need to export that static route into BGP. And then uh, even if GW1 did have a route for it, it would send it to PE1 and in the INET.0 table, wouldn't know what to do with it. And so that's why we need that static route. And so that is configured. So that is our rib group configuration at this point. Now we need to go to uh, BGP and we need to add that rib group. So the gateway router, the GW1 router, is the 192.168.1.1 address. And so we have to set neighbor, specify that address. See, that's, that's right, you go family, inet. I think unicast rib groups. Yeah, there we go. Rib group. Then we specify our rib group. And that rib group was inet0 underscore red. And what this does, it'll take basically any, any routes that we're getting from this gateway router and use that rib group. Remember that rib group has that policy. So the only thing it's going to match on is that default route. And then we still have to send that route, that uh, static route to GW1 or GW1 won't know how to get back to it. So that static route that we just created. So, and we just want to do that on GW1. The other neighbor that we see there is the route reflector that's going to be reflecting 
other routes, uh, VPN routes. So we don't want to send this static route through that to the route reflector. It's unnecessary. So dot one. So we'll just do it on the neighbor export. And I think I have this configured already. Yes, yeah, send. Uh, I have it marked as VPN A. It should be VPN red. VPN A was something else I was using, but it's still the right policy. I'll show you the policy. Send VPN A. Yeah, so you can see it's protocol static, route filter for that particular static route. So we're good there. So let's go ahead and commit the configuration and see how this works out. All right, so that configuration is committed. Let's go ahead and look at the route table. Let's look for that default route. You can see here that that default route is now in the red.inet.0 route table. That's perfect. And you can see it's resolvable because we have that interface route, right? So let's look for that. Let's do the show route table red. And just look at the inet.0 table for red. And we see a few things here. We see that static route again, a default route, that's fine. We see the uh, uh, route for, uh, yeah, the uh, host two prefix. And what else do we have? This is the route I wanted to point out because that's that interface route that we copied in there. So that looks good. Everything looks really good there. And so what should we show next? Let's look at that static route. So show route 203.0.113.1. We can see that we have the static route in i0, and then we have direct route for that in the red.i0 table because that's an interface route we have in there. So we have that. That's perfect. That's what we want to see there. And let's make sure we're advertising the correct routes. So show route advertising protocol, say BGP, of course, then 182.168.1.1. That's the address of that gateway router. And we can say that we are sending that static route. Perfect. That's what we want to see. And then let's do the show route advertising protocol BGP again. And 203.1.113.1. That is the CE device. So this is what we're sending to the CE device. And we see we're sending that default route. That's the important thing we want to see here. We're still sending the, the prefix for that represents for host two in that subnet. So that's good and all. But we're sending that default route. That's important because CE1 doesn't have a default route configured and is expecting to get it through BGP. And so one last thing, let's go ahead and jump to host one and see we can actually communicate with different devices that we should be communicating with. All right, so here is host one and let's go ahead and attempt to ping the internet host. And this is a device that is split up onto a multiple virtual router. So I need to specify the routing instance of host one. And great, we can ping the internet host. That's what we want to see there. So then let's attempt to ping the, the host two, make sure we didn't mess up anything there. And we can ping host two. So that's great, everything is working. We're able to provide internet access for host one and any other host in that subnet as well at that site. And then we still can communicate host one to host two through the L3 VPN. That's perfect, that's exactly what we want to see. Now, one thing I do want to point out here real quick is that Host two currently doesn't have access to the internet. And so we would have to do the similar configuration on PE2 and as, as well as CE2 with the NAT stuff to get that working, but I'm not showing that here for the sake of time. So just keep in mind that really this is half of the picture and you'd have to do this to any other CEs in your network, any other sites in your VPNs that need an internet access like this. So that does bring us to the end of this learning byte. In this learning byte, we talked about how to uh, set up and configure a layer three VPN BRF internet access using a public IP address and, uh, and how to verify that as well. So as always, thanks for watching. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.